Hey guys, good morning. We are in the middle of a series called I Know I Am, where we are looking at the seven I am statements that Jesus makes in the Gospels. Today's I am statement is found in John chapter 10, verses 11 through 21. Here, Jesus announces himself as the good shepherd. So before we dive in today's, into today's text, let's go ahead and pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for who he is. Thank you for scripture that um, teaches us and helps us understand who Jesus is. And as we continue to learn about his identity and his essence, we continue to learn about who we are in relation to him. And so I pray, Father, today as we read that you would help us to understand um, and that you would help us to apply what we read. Father, we love you and we thank you um, for the love of Jesus and for the scriptures. And I just pray now that as I speak, I would speak with clarity and boldness and that you would get all the glory and the praise. It's in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen. All right, guys, this is my absolute favorite I am statement that Jesus makes. Um, a part of this is knowing my identity as a sheep, knowing that I am completely dependent upon the love of Jesus and the work of Jesus for my safety, my security, my salvation. Um, but also knowing and having this confidence that Jesus wants to be with me, that he wants to love and protect me, that he wants to lay down his life for me. And so this passage is extremely encouraging, and I hope that you feel the same way after we read it. So let's go ahead and read. We're in John chapter 10, starting at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So before we dive into what this passage is saying to us, let's go ahead and review some of the qualities of a sheep and qualities of shepherds. So sheep are dependent. They're completely dependent um, on a caretaker for their survival. They're absent-minded. Remember, they're not the most intelligent things walking around. And they're wanderers. But even in their wandering, they are loyal to the voice of their shepherd. So sheep know the voice of their shepherd and they respond to it. Um, they're, they will very rarely, if never, respond to a stranger's voice. Now, a good shepherd, on the flip side, will only call out to sheep um, who are his. Those that belong to him are his only concern. He knows them very well and he tends to their needs very faithfully. Shepherds are the providers, the protectors, and the keepers of their own sheep. Um, shepherds are the only way for um, sheep to receive proper care and to assure safety. So in all, a shepherd is very loyal, attentive, and alert. Um, they're sacrificial, dependable, and extremely disciplined people. So that's a quick review of the quality. Some of those you may have heard in last week's video um, where Jesus announced that he was the gate of the sheep. Um, so let's go ahead and look at what we can gather from today's verses. Um, so starting in verses um, 15 and verse 11, so 11 and 15, um, we see that a good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So not only does he lay down his life willingly, but he also has the authority to do so. It says so in verse 18. Let's go ahead and read that again. It says, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. 
this command I received from my father. So Jesus has the authority to lay down his life, but he also has the power to resurrect. And so Jesus displaying his love for us gave his own life to give us our life. Jesus died that we might have life. Um, after verse 11, in verse 12, um, we read, The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. So here we kind of see a shepherd contrasted with a hired hand. A hired hand has no ownership over the sheep, and so he cares very little about them. He has very little genuine concern for the safety of the sheep. But Jesus has ownership over those who are his. So the shepherd stays and protects the sheep from harm, unlike the hired hand. And the verse following, verse 13, uh, we see that analogy deepened a little bit. We're reminded that a higher hand not only doesn't have ownership or a genuine care for the sheep, but we are reminded that a sheep does, I mean, excuse me, a shepherd does care. And our shepherd is Jesus. We belong to Jesus. He has ownership over us. We are his and he cares for those who are his own. Next verse in verse 14, we're reminded about this truth, um, this truth that the good shepherd knows his sheep and that the sheep know him. I don't know if you remember this from last week, but Jesus's voice is the only voice that we ought to listen to. Jesus knows us intimately and he invites us into knowing him as well. And let's be clear, this isn't just a knowing who Jesus is, but it's an experiencing who Jesus really is. This is an intimate knowing. Jesus, our good shepherd, he knows us deeply. He knows everything about us, um, past, present, and future. And he cares for us in every single way, even to the point where he will discipline us because a shepherd disciplines those that he loves. So unlike any other person, Jesus cares for us deeply and he knows us fully. And Jesus also, um, because he is our good shepherd, he tends to us, um, he tends to our needs, he pays attention um, to the needs that we have and he sacrifices for us, even his very life, that we might have life. Further down in verse 16, um, we see this desire that Jesus expresses. Let me go ahead and read verse 16 for you. It says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen, I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. So here we see Jesus expressing this desire to be with us. And he wants all who belong to him to be with him as well. We see that Jesus values togetherness. He values community and belonging. Christ wants all um, who are his to be a part of his family. Jesus values every single person. It doesn't matter who they are, Jew or Gentile, man or woman, no matter the occupation, the ability, race or background, Jesus has a flock made up of many and he wants all of them to experience belonging. And he is that way, he is the way into that belonging. Remember Jesus last week said, or we studied Jesus's I am statement where he announced himself as the gate of the sheep, um, their passageway into safety and security and salvation into belonging. So here we see Jesus expressing, I want all who are mine to be with me. In those last few verses of the passage that we read, Jesus also makes a few parallels here. There are statements about him and the Father, and there are also statements about shepherds and sheep. And I wanna draw, um, I want to draw your attention to that. So let's look at verse 15 again. 15 says, Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So there are two things here um, that are happening. One, there's a mutual knowledge, a mutual knowing, if you must, between the shepherd and sheep, but also between Jesus and the Father. Like I said before, this knowing is much more than knowing who, um, but it goes beyond that to experiencing who. So as Jesus has this intimate relationship with his Father, a genuine closeness, um, because they're both God, they're one being, they share the same essence. They really know one another. 
Jesus also desires for us to experience his essence, to be in his presence, to have belonging within his flock, to experience that same closeness that he experiences with his own father. Another parallel that we saw in verse 15, it's a little bit more abstract, but it's there. Um, it, it talks about how we display love, real sacrificial love. Jesus confirmed his love for us by taking on the brutal and sacrificial death that belonged to us because we are sinners. Jesus did this to show his affections for us, um, but more importantly, to obey his father, to do the will of his father. Similarly, we show God that we love him by our obedience to him. If you want proof, go ahead. Let's take a look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. Um, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. You see, if we want to show Jesus that we love him, if we want to show God um, that we follow him, that we believe in him, then we will obey what he says. So after reading all of these verses, we see, we see that Jesus has revealed another piece of his identity to us. We see that he has shared his desires for his sheep, to be with his sheep, um, to have this deep, intimate knowing. And he's foreshadowed his coming sacrificial death on the cross for us. Um, several times he references that the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's a foreshadowing um, to his coming crucifixion. Now that he's done all of that, he's announced all of that in this passage, what is the response to this? Well, if you can recall, each time that Jesus makes one of these I am statements, we see him being met with confusion, with doubt, or even argument. So let's read again the last few verses here to see the response. Verses 19 through 20. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So what's the response? Again, there is division. Many Jews and others in the crowd said he was demon possessed. Now, in scripture, when you see demon possessed, sometimes it actually does mean demon possession because spiritual warfare is real, right? But it also has a close connection to madness in the culture. They thought that he had gone mad, that he was mentally ill or not all the way there. But either way, when Jesus made the claim, I am the good shepherd, some folks thought he had gone mad and some wanted to defend his claim. But the question here is, what do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is your good shepherd? Do you know and trust that he cares for you, that he knows you deeply? If you do, if you believe in him and if you love him, then you will obey him. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you so much um, for this passage. I'm always just so encouraged um, to know that my identity as a sheep means that I have a good shepherd who loves and protects and provides for me. And so I just declare and I affirm today, Lord, that I do believe in you. And I pray that you would help me to obey you, that I would read your word, that I would hear your word, and that I would be a doer of the word. So help us now, help me now, as, as I go out, help us all as we love and serve you this week. God, we only want to bring praise and honor and glory to your name. It's in the mighty name of Jesus, our good shepherd, that we pray. Amen. All right, guys, I will see you next week for another I Am Statement. Hey guys, I am here to show you another Bible study method. It's pretty common. It's called the SOAP method. There's four steps in the SOAP method. There's scripture, observation, application, and prayer. And so the first step, scripture, is where you read, write, or listen to the passage in the Bible that you're going to be studying. It's pretty simple. You just take the scripture at face value. Step two, observation, is when you start to make notes and get into the details of the passage. You look at the context, you find details, um, and you start to pick apart what it's saying. You ask questions of the text, and maybe you're trying to find like the big idea or the main point. Observation is a great step to go and look at some of those resources. 
Um, take a look at a study Bible and use the notes. Look at a concordance. Um, go to some online resources like the Bible Project. There's a lot of really great resources out there to help, under, help us understand the scriptures. The third step, application, is probably the hardest part. Um, this is where we make the scriptures personal. It's where we go from being readers of the word to being doers of the word. And so this is where you challenge yourself. Um, what did you learn about God? What did you learn about yourself? What did you learn about the faith or the doctrines um, that we hold tightly to? And how do you put that into practice? How do you transform the way that you live um, from what you read? And then the last step, prayer. This is probably the most important part. This is where you talk to God and you listen to him. And so I hope through this Bible study method of SOAP, scripture, observation, application, and prayer, that you are able to deepen your relationship with God and deepen your understanding of the scriptures.